people of Bristol, could you please put your hands together and welcome onto the stage the wonderful Jess Foster Q. Brilliant, thank you. Oh, God, thanks. Oh, God, thanks. Oh, crumbs. Thank you, thanks. Oh, yes, please. Lovely to be in lovely Bristol. <laughs> it's the actual best place. It is the actual best place. And it's so nice to have you all here and it all be packed out. Last time I recorded um, a stand-up special, it was during the, the secret awful times. <laughs> that we've all just, like, completely moved on from very quick. Um, where you were about, you were, in a room this size, you were allowed about four people in. And they each had to sit alone, <laughs> surrounded by little lateral flow tests <laughs> with an alcohol-free beverage. Um, it was pretty it's heartbreaking. It's great to have you here. I'm not going to take it for granted. I love it that we've got our freedom back. I think it's great, isn't it? We all, some of you might be sat next to a stranger coughing out loud. <laughs> I love it. I love having that back. Touchings back and central touchings back. I'll tell you why, actually, I'm so chuffed to have all this freedom back. It's because, I'm just going to say it, I actually don't think that human beings were designed to be scared for years and years. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just going to say it. I think it's made us weird. <laughs> uh, it's made me weird. And from what I've seen so far... <laughs> Yeah, it's made you weird. Um, I'm weirder, is my point. I'm much weirder than I was pre-pando. I'm lots of other things too. I'm somehow older. I'm older than three years older. How have I done that? Um, I'm gayer, way gayer. <laughs> no one ever cheers for older. Um, well, dear. Uh, we'll, we'll address weirder first, shall we? It's a social skill deficit. Um, all my social skills fully fell off during the holidays. Um, and they're not back. And it's been so long now since we had a lockdown, I think if they're not back now, they ain't never coming back, are they? I'm a changed woman. I think I am. I am different. Don't ask me how I am anymore. I'll actually fucking tell you. Um, I do go, because it's been so long now since we ha had all those, like, sort of, sort of trapped at home times. I do go for longer patches of time where, like, I won't say it out loud, I'm not that weird, but I will find myself internally sort of going, well, well done, Jess. <laughs> You've been normal at parties. <laughs> Stuff for weeks and weeks now. Um, and then something will come for me, because I got cocky. Every single time I get sideswiped. Most recently, it was a fist bump that did it. Um, somebody gave me a fist bump. Um, don't know why I've demoed. Patronising, if anything. You, you know what one is. Um, somebody gave me a fist bump, and I had to shout myself. Um, I knew they weren't trying to hurt me. I knew it wasn't a game. Um, but my brain just would not connect my body to remind me quick enough what to do with it. Uh, and I, so I panic met it with a high five. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, do not recommend. Um, doesn't work, Bristol, because you've mismatched your vibes, I've realised. Yeah, with a bit of sort of hindsight, I worked out what had happened. Um, a fist bump, it turns out, is as close as a British person ever gets to physically and verbally saying, hey, buddy, good job. <laughs> we can't actually say that in our own accent. Um, so we have to do it like that. Hey, buddy, good job. Um, but if you meet that with a high five, especially if you sort of really own it. <laughs> um, then you, you've really got no choice but to sort of envelope the fist. <laughs> um, and that's less, hey, buddy, good job, and more sort of yield. <laughs> and you might be thinking, I don't know what you're on about, I'm not weird, I kept all my social skills. Well done. <laughs> uh, I do keep meeting people like that. I keep meeting people who are fine. Um, I saw some colleagues I hadn't seen for years for all the topical reasons, um, and they were great, you know, very relaxed. Borderline charming. Uh, they were like, oh, I haven't seen you for ages. How are you doing? Cla classic. Um, <laughs> and they did all compliments. They're like, oh, I like your dungarees. I like your earrings. I went, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Look at these ulcers. <laughs> I don't think you're going to do that. 
the major problem with this like deficit in social skills is all my small talk is gone. It's done. Um, I haven't got any. I haven't got any small talk. Problem with that? This is my job. Uh, I don't know how much stand-up comedy you've been to see, um, but it is sort of the law that at some point I am meant to interact with you. <laughs> Luckily, you seem as keen as me. <laughs> um, I, it's really hard without small talk, um, the old audience comedian interaction. Uh, I've got big talk. We could try it with big talk. I've got plenty of big talk. I've got big talk for days. Um, it might be a bit intimidating to do one-to-one, -one, though, maybe. If we're going to do big talk, I reckon do a question for the room. Um, oh, um, what are we doing with our pubes? <laughs> is clapping what you're doing with the pubes. <laughs> I have toured this show and I have had some incredible answers. I'm surprised you're shy, Bristol. <laughs> I've met you before and you're not... Last time I came shave to Bristol... <laughs> <laughs> I think she said shave it, but it could have been shame it. <laughs> shave it! It was quite... It, it is quite a demanding voice that shouted that. I liked it. It felt like it's been, really been told, shave it! Well, whoever that was is going to have a fight because last time I came to Bristol, someone else shouted, long! <laughs> My favourite other responses in York, from the darkest recesses of York, I got a very posh trim. But my absolute tip-top best was, um, it was during the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and a lady sat in the front row, genuinely sat like that in the front row, went, centre parting. <laughs> Ledger. I should be more honest with you, my small talk did have a brief resurgence back when everyone was playing the game Wordle. Do you remember they, big, they brought out this game called Wordle? Do you remember when they first brought it out and everyone was playing it? It's basically like a word game. You get like a process of deduction, you get like six goes to deduce a five letter word by uh, any sort of process. It's sort of like a mixture of sort of linguistics and logic problem, really. It's actually sort of really addictive. I'm actually still playing it. I'm the last wordler in the West. Is there a single, is there a solitary single wordler left in here tonight? There in! The last turn her in! Um, is anyone, is, oh, I'm so relieved. Do you know what? I, I, we are dying out, wordlers. I don't know if you know, I did one show where there was no wordlers in the entire audience, and one woman, I think to make me feel better, put her hand up and went, my mum's still doing it. <laughs> but are there any, is there any of the uh, hot young things who just shouted yes to wordlers? Has anyone done it today? Oh, yes! Um, uh, how, it's that lady there, second row in the second section. You've done it today, is it? You've done it today. What's your name? Corin. Corin? Let's small talk about Wordle. <laughs> Let's do it, Corin. Um, Corin, how many did you get it in today? Four. Me too! Oh, my God, like brain twins! <laughs> and that's just really how you small talk about Wordle. <laughs> Corin's my best friend now. Um, no, Corin, how did you feel when the New York Times bought Wordle? Yeah, not, not brilliant. Not brilliant? <laughs> I'm not sure, Corin. I liked it more random. It's too complicated. It's got too complicated. She has actually, it turns out, got quite a long answer. <laughs> um, I've loved that answer, Corin. A lot of the time I ask people, um, <laughs> how do you feel when the New York Times bought Wordle? It turns out they, they didn't care because they've got a sort of full and rounded life. <laughs> but not me or you, Corin. I knew we were twins of the brain. I also cared, but I think for different reasons to you, by the sounds of it. I don't mind that it got harder. I don't mind American words coming up. What I hated is that they... I don't know if you know, if you know this happened. When the New York Times took this puzzle over, they cancelled loads of five-letter words. So there's loads of five-letter words that will never come up because the New York Times decided that they would be too potentially offensive. But I don't understand why they've chosen the words that they've chosen. Like, it doesn't make any sense. There's loads of filth still in there. You can still have minge, boner. <laughs> um, <laughs> But they've cancelled words like the American spelling of fetus. What? What is offensive about the word itself? <laughs> Ageist? <laughs> I don't know, but most upsettingly for me, on the banned list of words, is the word wench. <gasps> <laughs> yes, if you've been dragged in by a partner, that is the title of the show. <laughs> I didn't know it's an offensive word, did you? What a way for me to find out that out of all the comedians, it turns out I am an edgelord.
It's awful. No, you need the small talk. You've got to keep it up. You've got to keep up your wordling so you can keep up your small talk. You've got to keep small talking because you need it to make new friends. Um, and I think it's so important to keep making new friends, even into adulthood, because it's fine to have the old friends, but they've got all your smelly baggage, haven't they? They know everything about you. And what's great about making new friends, even into grown up nurse, is you get a clean slate, don't you? You get a fresh start. You can, you know, especially you can present yourself as whoever you want, can't you? With a new friend, can't you? Especially if you changed or whatever, you can present it. If you want, you can present yourself as fine. <laughs> and that's nice. And it's much harder to make a new friend with just big talk. I did it once. Um, it was in the first lockdown, the main one, the surprise one, the OG, the great unraveler. <laughs> it, I was trapped with just my ch young son, uh, four-year-old at that time, son, uh, during that one. So I was so desperate for the company of a, an adult who was physically there that in the year 2020, I actually made friends with my neighbour. <laughs> yeah, wait for it. In London. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if any of you have seen somebody who lives in London try and make friends with someone who happens to live on their road. <laughs> it's disgusting. <laughs> it's like watching a snake try and play a piano. <laughs> um, but I did it. Needs must, right? I did it, I went for it. I didn't muck about, I went for the woman who lives opposite me, Harmony. Um, not loads in common, you know, um, not an obvious choice for a new best friend on paper. I think sort of very much older than me, good two, three generations older than me. I don't know that we culturally got loads in common. Um, she, you know, just into different stuff. Um, she loves God. <laughs> Made me God. Um, God and flowers and stuff. Um, <laughs> um, but we did it, you know, we did it. And we did it without any small talk. And I thought, God, you know, this is perfect. Because we had the pandemic in common, we didn't need any of the old little boring old chit chat. We got straight into the juicy stuff, you know, births, death, divorce. We shared tears, fears, cakes. I thought, who needs a blooming small talk? This is perfect. I love it. Um, months in, though, I did realise I hadn't sown the perfect foundational seeds for a friendship when she said, You've never told me what you do for work. And I was like, Oh, I'm a stand up comedian. And she went, Oh my God. That's so exciting. I'll have to look you up, Francesca. <laughs> it's too late to ever correct her. I'm just gonna have to let her call me that for the rest of our lives. I am so aware that in this day and age, I am meant to, as a stand-up comedian, if I'm gonna talk about someone that's real in the world, I am under a strong ethical obligation to change their name, especially if they've got a distinctive name, like Harmony, especially if you're filming the stand-up. Um, but in this instance, what is the fucking point? <laughs> She's literally got no way of ever finding me. We've all had a bizarre amount of change in our life in the last few years. I think that's my point. I've had a particularly massive amount of change in my life in those last few years. About three years ago, I managed to leave a really long relationship, about a decade long. And that is easier said than done, isn't it? Because after that amount of time, everything's tangled up with him, isn't it? My living situation was tangled up with him. Finances tangled up with him. I'd had a kid with him. Leaving him also involved leaving my sexuality as I then knew it. Social life tangled up with him. Work stuff tangled up with him. Still, I managed to leave a 10-year relationship. Why can't I leave a WhatsApp group? <laughs> If it carries on like this, eventually I'll be in every single one. Um, I couldn't get over how much dating had changed. Like, I, I, I mean, obviously, it was like between nine and ten years. Of course it's going to change a bit. Um, but there were still some big surprises. Um, I didn't expect, for example, it to go 100% online. Um, obviously, things are getting more technological, but I didn't know it would go 100% online. Some of you are so young, you won't understand why I find that shocking. Um, it, it, <laughs> it, it's because in the olden days, um, it, if you met your partner online, you were a freak. <laughs> and now it's the law. It's the actual law now. It's the only place you are allowed to meet someone. If you are not... Now, if you approach someone... If you approach someone who's physically there, young people, IRL, um, <laughs> if, you, if you got to a stranger who is there, not 3D printed, not... They're physically there. If you go up to them and go, hello, please, my fancy you, and that is how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> they're allowed to phone the police. And the police go, you did what? You pub! Get online, you monster! <laughs> yeah. 
You've got to get online now. You've got to get online. You've got to, um, you've got to have a whole CV of yourself on there. You've got a whole exhibition of photographs of yourself looking sexy during hobbies. Uh, you've got to choose from a mere nine million identities at a time where it feels more loaded than ever before. What identity you choose? Because it feels like you're choosing a tribe for the whole of the rest of your life and never. It's this uh, it's minefield online dating. So many problems with it. Problem number one, fibbers. I didn't do any lying on my online dating, not because I'm a good person, um, because I realised too late. <laughs> uh, it turns out I've accidentally already given away every single fact, truth and secret about myself I've ever had in every single bit of stand-up podcast and interview I've ever done. You might think, so what? Right, but look, I've been doing stand-up for 15 years. <laughs> Yes, I know. <laughs> What's mad is it's only in the last sort of 18 months that I've looked around and gone, I'm not, I'm not sure all the other stand-up comedians are actually telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I did think we had to. <laughs> and I have fucked this hard. <laughs> I did a, I did a, sh <laughs> I did a show recently where the producer said to me, oh, um, f we'll have a website to go with this show, like a web page for your episode. Can I take information we need um, from your Wikipedia? And I was like, well, I haven't got one. Um, and he was like, yeah, you have. <laughs> um, worse than that, it's 100% accurate. <laughs> I don't think it's making the world a better place, is it, either, that people are constantly shitting out really personal information that nobody asks for, does it? Doesn't does anyone from Norwich to find out that we've all got access to every single person's every thought, opinion, and feeling thanks to social media? We all want a peek behind the curtain, don't we? Want a little peek behind the curtain of everyone else's lives? I never got the memo to buy any fucking curtains. <laughs> only got myself to blame. I did a podcast recently, we're under absolutely zero duress. I admitted to a very long childhood crush on Gandalf. <laughs> oh, I used to fancy such old men. <laughs> Gandalf, how the fuck do you explain that? I don't even mean the talented actor Sir Ian McKellen. I fancied the fictionally ancient wizard. <laughs> Gandalf. How the hell do you actually explain that? I suppose I did lose a granddad very young. <laughs> <laughs> that particular joke is a test. Um, <laughs> and if you liked it, you're my favourite. <laughs> so many problems with online dating, so many problems. Dick pics, ugh. Disgusting that that's still an issue in 2023, isn't it? Ah, oh, thousands and thousands and thousands of people every single day getting sent a pig of a dick that they haven't asked for every single day. That is rank that that's still going on. If you're someone who's got a dick thinking, I wonder if the stranger wants a pick these days, probably air on the side of no! <laughs> I've got women friends in comedy. I've got women friends that these are clowns. These aren't people who are sexy for a job. They get up to 20, 30 dicks a week. That is rank that that's still going on. I, am, I can't believe worse than all of that. More wrong than all of that. Why have I never got one? <laughs> that is not an invitation. Um, and this feels like something very Gen Z about online dating. It feels designed by them and for them, and I think I mean that in several ways. Um, firstly, I think the sort of, like, you, you need to be so sure about exactly who you are and exactly what you want, and that feels, like, impressively very Gen Z. That feels like a very Gen Z vibe. I think the comfortability with all of the different identities and all the different meanings of all of the different things feels very Gen Z. I am in awe of the progress that that generation have made in terms of feminism. Well, you could just call it self-worth. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm lucky. I've got um, half sisters who are still in their late teens and early twenties. So I've got I've got some direct feedback on this. The progress they have made, honestly, when I was that age, I mean, it wasn't great. <laughs> um, I'm a geriatric millennial, so when I was their age, I was still doing stuff like um, here's an example. Um, my generation of women, ever since school, we trained ourselves, didn't we? If we were using a public bathroom, we trained ourselves. Who trickle our wee wee out, didn't we? <laughs> as quietly as we could. <laughs> One or two droplets at a time. <laughs> Silently, if we could. <laughs> Ideally, as a mist. <laughs> Some of our wee wees took up to a month to finish. 
all because the thought of another person hearing the pitter patter <laughs> of your disgusting urine <laughs> that you should have learned to reabsorb like a real lady <laughs> was somehow mortifying. But you'll be relieved to know Gen Z women aren't doing that. Thank God Gen Z women have evolved out of doing that. I don't know if you shared a bathroom with one of them recently. The only thing you can hear over the sound of their glorious, thunderous piss <laughs> is every now and again one of them will go, does anybody want to borrow my moon carpet? It's massive! <laughs> it's progress. My youngest baby sister, she just turned, she's turned 20 now, actually. She is extraordinary, right? We went for lunch. About six months ago, we went for lunch. Now, nothing makes you feel old. Like, when you catch yourself saying to a 19-year-old, so, are you seeing anyone? <laughs> but I did. And she couldn't have had a better response. She went, God, no. I find boys my age pathetic. It's going to have, like, hot girl summer. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> What is it? <laughs> I've had a look online. I'm not sure anybody knows. Uh, from what I can see, it looks exhausting, and I'm not sure I can be fucked. <laughs> I don't know if it's appropriate. I'm genuinely not sure I can be asked. I hope that's not unambitious. I'm just going to aim for, like, a warm woman spring. <laughs> There's a sexual confidence required for online dating as well, I think. There's, like, make great big massive lists of things that you, you, you like, say that you're into or not into. I don't even know what half the fucking words mean. Oh, you know, I've got friends who say to me, wow, you need to get with it. You know, it's great that the world's so sex positive. You know, and they're probably right, you know. And they're like, yeah, well, it's your, it's your problem. You're the one who needs to, like, um, like, like, enlighten yourself and educate yourself if you'd feel uncomfortable with all that stuff. And I'm like, well, I think the problem actually is that it resets the bar for normal people, doesn't it? If you, everybody needs to know all the... You know, some of the friends that are telling me that I need to get on board with all that stuff are the same friends. I've got one friend who told me that sometimes in her normal life, um, for her partner, she does a sexy dance. <laughs> I mean one with, like, no laughing in it. <laughs> oh, what? Sure, it happens in films and... Probably France. <laughs> but we don't have to do that now, do we? Oh, it's just normal arts. Is that with a bar set now for, like, you and me? Oh! Oh! What the fuck? Where would you fucking begin? <laughs> a piece of equipment and I didn't just make someone so turned on they they fainted <laughs> <laughs> it's um it's that bit has evolved right over the course of this show over the full Edinburgh Fringe and then the, the whole of this tour I thought oh you know as the, as the show grows and stuff that bit with the sexy dance bit it's gonna get longer and longer and um, it, it's got shorter <laughs> One thing that happens if you haven't been single for a decade and you suddenly find yourself single again is you do find yourself desperately wanting to feel relevant again, you know, and you want to feel sexy again in a way that I hadn't even realised I stopped caring about, you know, and I have found myself asking hundreds and hundreds of audiences now what they're doing with their pews. <laughs> um, they're, clap they're clapping their pubes in Bristol over there. Uh, what was that? Pluck them. <laughs> Surely that advice could only come from someone with a mere four to five pubes. <laughs> that is a deeply impractical top tip. If I ever met one, but I might give it a go. Thank you for the original take on what to do with them. I, I can't get a consensus, and now there's a new thing to add into the mix of options. As I understand it, generally, there seems to be, like, two schools of thought. There seems to be what I would call a sexually decisive feminist movement to go full wolf. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I'm also told a lot of people under the age of 30 literally never heard of a pube. <laughs> Again, yeah, they're going to be taking down a yoldy pube museum. <laughs> to have it proven to them what a pube ever was. Um, and they feel quite extreme as options, you know. It feels like someone's gone, well, you can do absolutely nothing or absolutely loads. I think, well, I don't know what to do absolutely. Well, if you met me, absolutely nothing sounds manageable. Yum, yum, yum. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> 
I want to feel sexy. That's the whole point. So I want to feel hot, you know. I want to feel great at my bard. You know, it's got to be some boundaries to sexiness. Like, I like the idea of going full wolves. I'm absolutely fine, but I'm of an age now where it doesn't want to stay in the main triangle. What are, <laughs> what are the boundaries? There's got to be some hotness boundaries. Are there? Are there? Are there? What are the boundaries? What are they? What are they? What are the boundaries? What are the? What are the boundaries? What are? They? Is it? Is it knees? <laughs> I can sense I've made some of you feel uncomfortable. I can be more euphemistic. <laughs> My belly beard peninsula is making a very strong plate tectonic bid to join the mainland. <laughs> is that still hot? Is that hot? <laughs> Even calling it a peninsula makes it sound too organised. It's patchier than that, more of an archipelago. Some of you might go on your honeymoon. <laughs> No, I think when it comes to pubes, you should do whatever's going to make you feel snazzy about your body, even if that means pluck them. <laughs> um, you might need to take a half day off um, to get through mine. Um, oh, I think you should do whatever's going to make you feel great about your bod, even if that means having a twat wax, by the way. I think you can have a twat wax as a feminist. Yes, I do, actually. I think you can. I think you could even have a twat wax as a pragmatist, potentially, cos you could argue that you can get increased sensitivity, but then you could also argue that all music is always better on MDMA. You wouldn't want it to be the only way you could ever consume it. <laughs> Just a little joke there for anyone who's come, not with their parents or colleagues. <laughs> I think you can. I, I, I think you can have a twat wax as a feminist, by the way. I think you can feel empowered all the way through it. Um, if you don't know what a twat wax is, if you're like, what's she on about? Um, it, it, it's quite simple, really. Buckle in. Um, <laughs> it, it, you go to a salon, and someone there, it's normally a woman, she'll rip the pubes from your top, and it's not for love, just for cash. <laughs> Uh, and that's the first bit that can feel empowered, actually, because you think, well, I can afford it, I feel empowered, thanks very much. Often you're supporting an independent female-led business, you think, I feel empowered, thanks very much. Um, obviously, then you've got the fact that um, uh, once you're in there, you've got to get naked in front of a stranger. Not fully naked, actually, she doesn't want to see your tits. Um, <laughs> I'm not advocating that, but no, you can feel empowered all the way through. You've got, my point is, you've got to take, you've got to get, you've got to get your belly button, you've got to get, you got to get your clam out in front of a stranger. I think that takes a certain amount of body confidence, actually. So you can do it. I feel empowered all the way through. You can feel empowered all the way through it. Obviously, then you've got the fact that once it's actually done, you're going to feel for a little bit like a silky otter. I feel empowered. <laughs> That's so much. Even during the bit where she's actually ripping the pubes out and it really hurts, you think, well, actually, it only hurts a bit. I'm strong enough to take that much pain. I'm an adult. It only hurts a bit. I feel empowered. You can feel empowered all the way through it. <laughs> Until the bit. <laughs> where she says, now. <laughs> Roll onto your front. You roll onto your front there. It's never one of those beds that's got the lovely, lovely comfy donut for you to rest your face in, is it? You've always got to smush your face actually into the leather of the bed, haven't you, there? You can't risk leaving it out to the side like that, can you? Because then you risk eye contact. <laughs> she says, now roll onto your front, doesn't she? And you do it. And then she says, now, madam, pop one hand on one buttock. And you do it, don't you? Are you listening? <laughs> and then she says, Pop one hand on your other butter. <laughs> and you do it, don't you? <laughs> and then she says, Now, pull those buttocks apart. <laughs> and you do it, don't you? I'm so sorry. <laughs> and then she slathers the wax in there, doesn't she? And then, because that wax has got to set before she can rip it off, <laughs> face in the bed, <laughs> you, an adult who's paid for this, has to stay there like that, don't you? <laughs> For ages. <laughs> and during that bit, I am actually yet to meet anyone who does still feel empowered. <laughs> and let me tell you, there's never been another sharper, more tangible time where I've ever thought perhaps it isn't an entirely good thing <laughs> that I've got to a point in my career where I am occasionally recognised.
incredibly, not the end of the pube stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do think you should do whatever's going to make you feel snazzy about your body when it comes to pubes, but I also wish we'd be a bit less shy, you know. I um, wish people would take a leaf out of Bristol's book and be a bit more honest when people say what we're doing with our pubes, because I think a lot of the time you just want to know what everyone else is fucking doing, don't you? Especially when you're young. What teenager wants to be a moth topiary pioneer? <laughs> I certainly didn't. <laughs> and I don't get memos, you know, I need a bit more information on the flipping memo, I do. I never got the information. Also, I, I mean, I grew up in Dorset in the 90s. <laughs> no one was doing anything to their pubes then. They're still wearing bum bags from the first time round. Good on them. <laughs> but it meant I had no idea what was going on. When I was age 18, I moved to London for university. I realised at the time it was women only, but they were all just doing stuff to their pubes, you know. So I'd say to a friend, you know, oh, so what we say, hang on, so what are we doing? And they'd be like, well, you know, you, you know. <laughs> You just get rid. You just get rid. Uh, I'm like, <laughs> but like what? But like, say so what? Say so like what? Yeah, like what? Yeah. What actually do you do, do, you do then? And then they'd be like, I mean, just you just get rid. You just get rid. Oh yeah, cool, yeah. <laughs> and we must communicate. I mean, I start. I started seeing someone. I thought he's going to expect that, so I did it. Right, and he comes around and things start happening, nice things, sexy things. He gets the sort of hands in pants all the time, sort of those base two, three, base two, three, four. I don't know the bases, two, three, four, more. Five stuff, nice things, sexy things. And he goes like, ah, oh. and I was like, great, you know, great, he's noticed. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we, 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 must communi we must communicate because things progressed, right, nice things, sexy things. But it gets the sort of business time, sort of pants and trousers, right, off, sort of business time, busy, busy business time, business time. <laughs> And we must communicate, because it gets to that stage and he goes, Oh! <laughs> and what I'd done... <laughs> is, um, I'd, got re <laughs> I'd got rid of all the hair there, but um, I'd left absolutely everything there. <laughs> give you a couple more seconds for that image to sink in. <laughs> <laughs> Sexiness-wise, I've given myself the vaginal equivalent of a monk's haircut. <laughs> Imagine being prepared to tell audiences full of strangers that, but lying on dating apps. <laughs> Wouldn't be on, really, would it? Wouldn't be on. Um, I didn't do lying on dating apps. <laughs> Again, I don't think particularly because I'm a good person, mainly because I didn't want to muck people about, but including myself, you know, I'm busy. I didn't want to bother meeting up with people that didn't at least know the basics about me, you know? Like, I, I think there were things that I was like, I don't want to get to the point where I'm actually going out for a drink with someone that doesn't know that I've got this silly job, that I've got a young child. Like, I needed people to know that stuff in advance. Um, but, you know, I also wanted to get, like, picked. I wanted to get swiped on, I wanted to get chosen, I wanted to get laid. Um, <laughs> so how do you be honest about those things whilst also still making yourself sound like a catch? <laughs> I'm available for sexy dates between 9am and 3pm. <laughs> My language is so mollified by parenthood that the other night I accidentally said goodbye to a big taxi driver by going, Nan night, sleep well. <laughs> The, the biggest wake-up call that I got, the dating was going to be really different this time round. A decade on with where my life was at now as a parent was this. So, historically, whenever I'd been single, I'd really enjoyed putting it about. <laughs> yeah, no shame in that. Borderline pride, actually. No one was holding the making that fun. Yum, yum, in my vagina. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it did mean that once or twice in my early early 20s, late teens, during that last single time. Um, you know, I, I had to do that awkward but responsible thing once or twice, of phoning someone up and going, oh, God, one of us has given the other one some kind of STI. <laughs> <laughs> well, this time round, I genuinely had to phone someone and say, oh, I'm so sorry, but um, I'm, I'm pretty confident I've given you nits. <laughs> Uh, incredibly, she's the one I'm engaged to now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're right to woo, she's smashing. Um, but it's interesting, you know, I think it is interesting. You start a new relationship well into your 30s and there is baggage. There's no clean slate. You've got to get your smelly old baggage out. So much baggage. Um, as I said, I've got one child, human. Um, she's got two, <laughs> feline. <laughs> Although I'm increasingly being taught, no less important. Uh, 
Um, uh, my uh, human son uh, absolutely loves my missus. I think he can instinctively tell um, just because she's a few years younger than me that makes her inordinately cooler than me. Um, I think it helps that she's covered in tattoos of animals like an awesome walking zoo. <laughs> Um, and, you know, it's been great having someone be able to come into his life who's got, like, time for fun and ideas for games. And, and uh, it's been brilliant having, uh, having, having as, uh, her fresh, fresh eyes as a spotlight on my parenting. <laughs> um, I mentioned that my language is mollified. Um, it's had to become. Um, here's the origin story of why. We'll go back a few years. My son was two, maybe three years old. It's just me and him in the car, right? I'm still with his dad at this point, and out the back of the car, my son goes, Daddy says, both of crying out loud. <laughs> and I was like, ha, ha, ha. yeah, he does. Oh, my God. He says that all the time. He probably says that all the time. It's almost like a catchphrase. I can't believe I'd never noticed it, and you've clocked that. That's amazing. He does always say that. What does Mummy say anyway? Mummy says, fucking fuck. <laughs> She doesn't. <laughs> You've misheard. Um, my mummy says, crumbs alive. <laughs> Ooh, you know, remember mummy's catchphrase? Crumbs alive. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, I need to confess, my, I have got no self-control and really bad road rage, and it did mean that my son did learn all the worst swears by probably a source of roughly illegally young age. Um, <laughs> You'll be relieved to know, though, if you're sensible or the police or whatever. Um, <laughs> it's had a surprise consequence in the sense that now, age seven, he is the biggest language prude I have ever met. <laughs> he hates bad language. He will sniff it out and he will hunt it down and he will find it. <laughs> and he will crush it. Honestly, he's like, man over there, man over there, red hair over there, behind that bin, behind that bollard over there, just on two Fs, I don't like it. <laughs> Skip that song, skip that song. Too many B words. It's like living with a tiny Mary White House. <laughs> the other day we were on a play date with other families and I, I like, properly banged my leg and I went, ah, oh, sugar. And he went, well done, mummy, not saying shit. <laughs> I do want to be a good parent. I really care about being a good parent. I hope that I'll naturally just sort of evolve into a good parent over the years. <laughs> Um, there's loads of stuff I feel passionate about as a parent. Mm. I mean, I would love my son to have minimal shame around certain things. That feels important to me. I would love him to be the first generation ever who can be, like, completely unembarrassed about having a queer parent. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, I would also particularly love him not to have shame around his body and eating and drinking. I feel so strongly about that. Hopefully I've brought him up so far to be sort of really joyful and curious about those things. Um, <laughs> the other day, uh, I was having an alcohol-free bit. I told you I was a geriatric millennial. <laughs> Um, and, um, and he said, can I try that? And I thought, actually, I can't see the harm in that. I don't think I actually like the taste of beer until I was well into my 20s. Wow, he sculled it. <laughs> I didn't know a six-year-old could drink like that from a little glass bottle like that. <laughs> Surprise it out of his hands. That's so nice. That's so delicious nice. That is so nice. That... <laughs> I've just spent the last year walking into places with a six-year-old who walks in and goes, have they got Corona? No. No, no, they haven't. No, they haven't. No. No, but he can read now, can he? So he'll be like, yes, I have. Yeah, they've got it there. Why can't I have it? Sometimes they'll actually get the bottle and be like, why can't I have it? It hasn't got any alcohol, it's got less sugar than juice, hasn't even got any caffeine. Why can't I have it? And I find myself going, because it's not a good look for mummy. <laughs> I mentioned it. My human son loves my missus. He does. Um, no offence to her, but, you know, I think that's quite easily done. I think his heart is quite easily won. I think if you're prepared to have enough ideas of games to play, get him anything from that tat shop tiger, keep your language clean, get the odd round in. <laughs> I'll fall for you. The cats, however, have been much harder to impress. <laughs> I, I can't talk about this within my own home, because I, I can't tell you how much she loves these cats. I'm going to say too much. 
Um, but actually, I'm just going to say, I, I actually think the council might be homophobic. <laughs> I've got loads of evidence. One of the cats likes jumping on the kitchen surfaces, licking all around, furring all around. Um, <laughs> really nice. Someone just going, ugh. Oh. <laughs> I'd be careful to do that out loud in an audience this queer. <laughs> this is my edgiest bit in this crowd. Yeah, he jumps all over the kitchen services where I do the cooking. And I was quite hard, hard. I think, you know, I was quite short. You know, I said to my missus, do you think there's any way we could get him not to do that? Fucking disgusting thing. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, all right. You know, he's a cat, it's not a problem. We'll just discipline him. I'll buy a water spray can. And in fairness, she did. Um, so next time he jumped up there, I went to spray him. And she was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, God. See, you didn't have to spray him. You know, it didn't sp actually spray <laughs> At least try mediation first. <laughs> so me, the human, has to go, Conrad, please hop down. <laughs> Incredibly, he didn't. <laughs> so I, you know, I go to spray him, and she's like, whoa, 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 trigger happy. The next thing she made me do is hold the watering can out like that and just sort of shake it, just sort of gently show it to the cat. Pretty confident I heard the cat go <laughs> <laughs> Then and only then am I allowed to spray the prick. You can imagine the catharsis. <laughs> but it turns out she hadn't bought a normal water spray can, had she? She'd bought a mister for succulents. <laughs> so water did come out of it, but in a lovely gentle plume. <laughs> I swear to you that cat went. He's even better at sexy dancing than me. <laughs> Which brings me on to my main evidence against them, actually. There's no delicate way of putting this, but both the cats watch us bonk, and they're not very encouraging. <laughs> Conrad the kitchen jumper watches like that. <laughs> and Cleo, if anything, is worse. She's somehow found a way of sort of watching like that. And I was really letting this knock my confidence. <laughs> but then, actually, in this instance, I realised I think I might need to take some responsibility because I thought about it, and actually, there's been an empathy fail, hasn't there? On my part. Um, because at the end of the day, they're cats, aren't they? <laughs> they're cats. And what cats thinking? If they're watching two women have sex, they're probably thinking, well, they are having a very thorough wash. <laughs> What a noisy wash! <laughs> Surely that bit's done, at least. I feel incredibly privileged to have met my queerness now in terms of where we're at in space and time and history. I think largely I've been able to ride into queerness on the coattails of centuries of other people's activism. <laughs> Thank you, universe, yum, yum, yum. <laughs> Lucky me. Um, I think the only thing is probably even easier to be compared to 50 years ago now than queer is probably vegan. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you can get vegan food everywhere now, can't you? I mean, you can get plant-based food everywhere you go, and they let me learn to do stuff, you know, they're amazing. You can get a full vegan menu in Weatherspoons pubs now. <laughs> do you know Weatherspoons? Where progress went to die. <laughs> I think it's an incongruous place to be able to get a full vegan menu. But, you know, I just mean that vegans haven't had to have centuries of being sort of, like, um, oppressed and jailed and killed and converted to get their own whole menu, have they, in Weatherspoons? You could argue they've had a long time of culinary oppression if you tasted tofu. <laughs> <laughs> no, none of us have, but we've all eaten it. Um, I even feel privileged, uh, I feel especially privileged to have met my queerness as an adult as well. I think it's much harder if you're not straight when you're a child. Because when you're a kid, your whole self-worth hinges, doesn't it, on how respected and valued you feel by the people around you, especially by your family. Whereas once you're in your mid-30s, you think, wow. <laughs> 
You can disown me if you want, actually, Uncle John. I couldn't give a fuck. <laughs> I'll be honest, Uncle John has always been a chore. <laughs> Bye, John. <laughs> oh, John, before you go, please, could you chuck me out of the WhatsApp group? <laughs> um, there hasn't been nothing. I've noticed bits and bobs. Um, I've had a bit of disbelief. I found that fascinating. Um, I've had a bit of disbelief that I was ever straight. I think like people like to think of all queerness as being born in a terrible closet full of the tears of Kelly Holmes and Philip Schofield. <laughs> <laughs> And not to belittle their terrible experience, but I'm afraid that wasn't my experience. I wasn't having an oppressed time, I'm afraid, so I was having a fucking great time loving and fucking all those blokes. Woohoo! Um, I had loads of opportunities to get off with women, didn't want to, don't know what happened. One day something changed, really did! Um, I'm only a clown, I can only speak to my own experience. I don't understand the chemistry of it, I've got no sciencey way of backing this up. The only evidence I can think of is can you imagine a less lesbian crush than Gandalf? <laughs> I've been fascinated by the curiosity I've had. Um, so it, I even naively thought that by now, if you were sort of in public in a same-sex relationship, that that was like, you know, I, I didn't realise that you're still, like, spotted. You get, even if you're in, like, a busy city or a festival or something like that, like, you, you get noticed. You get, like, whispered about, you get, like, giggled about, you get, like, sort of seen in a way. And I think because I've had such recent straight relationships to compare it to, I was a bit like, oh, God, that, it's like people are sort of... Like, sometimes you get the impression people genuinely are, are negative. You get the idea sometimes I mean, people are excited to have seen two women together in the wild. <laughs> Sometimes I get the idea that people are genuinely so excited about it they couldn't not say something or point or something. Like, you know, when you see a really, 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 really big dog who one of its granddads must have been a horse. <laughs> a bit of that still if you're two women together. Um, m the tangiest bit of curiosity that I have had, I've had more than one friend my own age, when I say I'm dating a woman, go, oh my. I mean, like, what do you actually, what do you actually do? <laughs> Where do I begin? I mean, the problem's with the question, isn't it? <laughs> the problem is with the question, what do you actually do? That is a... M I mean, for a start, no straight person's ever been asked that, ever, have they? No straight person's ever said to their friend, oh, I'm seeing someone new, and the friend's first thing to be like, oh, right, tell me exactly how you fuck. <laughs> Just wouldn't. What do you actually do, they're asking. Also, where the hell have these friends been? What do you actually do? I'm pretty sure they've used the internet ever. What do you actually do? Knowing my luck, the exact answer is probably on the Wikipedia page. <laughs> what do you actually do? How straight are these friends that they cannot work it out? It also portrays a massive lack of imagination, doesn't it? What do you actually do? What do they think two women do when they get in the bedroom? They think we're just sort of stand there. <laughs> It's really sort of seriously and morosely, sort of slowly. We sort of miserably take off our clothes. Look down in a really disappointed way at where a willy still hasn't grown. Just hold hands again. <laughs> if you wanted, maybe I could try and do a dance. No. <laughs> And there's the labels, and there's choosing an identity for your sexuality. I hadn't realised what a minefield it was out there. I hadn't realised how spicy and politicised it had all got. I hadn't realised how sensitive it all was. I hadn't realised the wars that were going on. I hadn't realised the thesis that they were behind every single one of these identities. Oh, my God, I hadn't realised what I was getting myself into. Also, I hadn't realised how lucky I'd been up until this point to have previously been born into every label I'd ever had, like a beautiful comfy nest. Never had to pick a new one. And when you start, oh, you know, you always think you already know who you are. It's really confusing. You don't know what to do. I fucked it up. I thought, well, I'll just try them on, like, clothes. See what I feel like suits me. Not a great way to do it. I made so many mistakes. Initially, I told everyone I was bisexual. Then I learned about pansexuality. Thought that much better describes me, but I identified as pansexual on Radio 4's Now Show and Twitter lit up. <laughs> and let me know that I had single-handedly erased bisexuality. <laughs> I didn't know I could do that all by myself. 
I don't know if you've ever felt simultaneous sadness, shame, and incredible power. <laughs> it's confusing, and frankly, enough to put you off. I was like, oh, God, I can't be asked with this. Don't involve me in your argument I didn't even know existed. I can't join in with a war I didn't even know was there. Oh, I can't be bothered with this. I'm not going to have a sexuality then. I'm just not going to have a sexuality identity. I'm going to be one of those people that refuses to talk about it. I'm just going to say it's none of your business. I'm just going to Cliff Richard this shit. And then I thought, no, it's not good enough. That's not very respectful, is it, to the hundreds of thousands of people who sacrificed and died in the pursuit of equality for LGBT plus people. Just, you got to have an identity, you got to have a sexuality, a right to make up your own one, have a bespoke one. But all I could think of was swings always, or potentially liable to fancy literally fucking anyone. I think we can all agree, not very catching. It makes me sound even less discerning than we've already established that I aren't. <laughs> So I'm left with queer, I identify as queer. I mean, it does the job, doesn't it? It covers every base. I would say it's arguably a little bit rudely vague. <laughs> um, it does shut down future conversation, doesn't it? It means so many things. Yeah, I mean, this, mm, I do feel a little bit like when I identify as queer, I feel a little bit like someone's gone, where do you live? And I've gone, Earth. <laughs> But it does the job. The only other real problem I've got with, with queer is that, I, uh, as a word, is, um, you know, I've got boomers in my life, and, and I've only just persuaded them to stop using that as a slur. <laughs> um, um, and, you know, I have some sympathy. I, I've got people in my life, boomer age, who say to me, oh, did you just say, did you just say, did you just say queer? <laughs> and you're like, yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh, right. Well, you can just, <laughs> we just bring the, we just bring a word back to you. You just, or you just use that one. Because <laughs> it's decades ago that you stopped, you know, that we all stopped saying, so what you can just, well, what other words are bad? Careful, Mum! <laughs> <laughs> careful, careful! <laughs> I don't think we often enough doff our caps to anyone at least attempting to keep up linguistically with kindness, because we're changing things at such an incredible pace now that it is really hard to keep up. I don't think we're anywhere near often enough acknowledge the fact that all the language that us, we here right now today, are using to be as kind and inclusive and progressive as possible will, in quite a short space of time, be the bad words, the toxic words, the words we hope that everyone can, can everyone try and hopefully try and forget that we ever sound actually. Can you see what I'm doing here? I'm covering my future back. <laughs> Because I don't stand a fucking chance. I've missed every single memo that's come my way over time. There's no way I'm keeping up linguistically with kindness. I do not stand a chance. I've got a seven-year-old. I give it five years max before I walk past my son and he's saying to a friend, oh my God, you just over here, my mum. She just said neurodiverse, what bigger? <laughs> I'll be like, ah, oh, I thought it was a kind word. <laughs> He'd be like, yeah, okay, millennial. <laughs> I think we can get so kind of tense over language that it can make people, even people who are definitely kind, panic. Um, Harmony is actually a really good example. My neighbour, because she watched my life transform from over the road. Um, I mean, literally from opposite. You know, she watched me move into the house opposite her with a man and a kid. It's pretty conventional. It's pretty unchallenging. But then she watched the man go away. <laughs> she watched the man go away. Um, <laughs> and then she watched a woman come round. Again, again and again and again, <laughs> again and again. It, to be clear, when I titled the show Wench, it was meant to be quite a lot more women. Um, I had no idea it'd only take me three months to fall in love. Livid. <laughs> she watched one woman come round again and 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 again. Hopefully, forever. And she 100% took that in her stride. Harmony couldn't have cared less. She totally got it. She couldn't have given a shit. But every now and again, over words, she'd get in a pickle. So there'd be times where she was like, well, don't worry, I'll get the parcel if you want later from your, 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 your. I always put her out of her misery and said girlfriend, but I was desperately hoping that one day she'd go for gentle lady caller. But, uh, you know, I'm not surprised Harmony was cool. I'm very lucky where I live. I live in South East London and, um, I mean, you know, it's a pretty chill place. I, I, I love it. I think traditionally when comedians are from th there, 
Uh, they're horrible about it, you know, um, but I think it's an amazing place to live for lots of reasons. Um, one of them is, and the main one really is, it's like a diversity utopia where I live. There's every single person that you have ever possibly imagined living together pretty much side by side, kind of pretty much all the time, getting along great. Uh, my son goes to a primary school. Here's a good example. He, he goes to a primary school where th they do a thing where I think they do this across, um, across Britain, actually, where um, they, once a year, they have this like week of culture where they all learn about each other's cultures. And on the last day, they're encouraged to come in dressed as whatever they feel represents their culture. <laughs> Lovely, but if you saw my son's playground on that day, you'd be like, who wrote this naively woke Argos advert bullshit? <laughs> it looks like it's staged because it's everything you've ever dreamed of. Do you know what I mean? There's saris, kimonos, Ankara fabrics, Romanian football shirts. There was a fucking Dutch milkmaid. <laughs> So you can imagine living in an area like that. I was quite surprised um, back when we had the elections for a new mayor, when um, one of our candidates, even in an area like that, a lady called Maureen, was really openly homophobic in her manifesto. Um, what was really annoying, though, was that the rest of her policies were great. <laughs> really great. Um, oh, oh, she was going to end knife crime. <laughs> well, do you not mind it? Um, <laughs> She was going to deliver affordable housing. Mm, yes, please, Maureen. I lo I'd love that. I would love that. I didn't even know mayors could do that. <laughs> no, I genuinely, it, I genuinely, this is the one, this is the policy that was really going to give me, I was going to vote for her. She genuinely was going to promise, finally, to tackle fly tipping. Maureen, where have you been all my life? Honestly, people don't understand what it's like if you live in London. I, I was like, toured the show all over the country and people do not get it. They do not understand. To me, that's proof that Maureen is a proper Londoner through and through. You lot here probably still don't even get it. You think in London the streets are paved with gold. No, actually, mainly bedding. <laughs> and if you're lucky, the odd Billy bookcase. <laughs> she nearly had my vote, but she had a six point plan. And point number three, genuinely right next to tackle fly tipping, was that she wanted to simply state the truth that a natural marriage is only ever between a man and a woman, and that is the only safe environment in which to ever bring up a child. <laughs> so that was printed onto, um, <laughs> that was such a funny set of reactions. Just like a load of boos and hisses, and then someone going, oh. <laughs> oh. Okay. So you could go looking for Maureen's manifesto, but it was also printed onto a colourful pamphlet that was dropped through every door in the whole of the borough. So those words landed on my doorstep in my house where, as I said, my son can read. And I had a visceral reaction to this, a big emotional reaction to this. I was like, surely I shouldn't have to have this shit in my face. I shouldn't have to have that shit through my door and actually in my face. Can you put anything in a manifesto then, can you? Are you allowed to say things like unnatural and not allowed your own kids? Are there any rules? I wonder what the rules are. Surely someone should know what the rules are. You shouldn't have to have that shit, surely in my face. I reassured my young son by going, you are safe here! <laughs> And then, you know, I just had a normal reaction, you know. I took to the streets, by which I mean Twitter. <laughs> um, but then, then the real streets had big conversations back and forth with the council trying to work out what you are and aren't allowed to put in a manifesto. There are some rules, but it turns out they're all secret, actually. And then I had great big long meetings with the police at their request who were amazing about it. Back and forth, back and forth, all about it. A big long Guardian newspaper article about it. You know, just normal reactions. <laughs> Weeks into this activism, I noticed that a lot of people in my life, including in my queer community, including my own partner, weren't anywhere near. So I fired up about this as me. You know, and I said to her, you know, you don't seem as passionate about this situation as, as, me, as me, if you don't mind me saying it. She was like, no, yeah, no, fair enough. I mean, the thing is, a lot of people do ha have those opinions. And I was like, well, yeah, it's almost like you're a lot more used. <laughs> and I think I realised what had happened is that I'd had what had been, <laughs> up until that point, um, a life of almost 100% privilege. <laughs> <laughs> and mummy's had mummy's first homophobia and mummy's gone big! <laughs> <laughs> I felt a bit green, I felt a bit embarrassed, but you can't choose what's going to offend you. You can't choose what's going to, like, get you in that place in your tummy, can you? I hope you can't choose what's going to offend you. Um, I wouldn't have called this show Wench if I thought anybody might find it actually really offensive as a word. I'm, I'm not that sort of comic. Um, I, I genuinely just thought it was, like, 
just a really great word for a bit of a silly old slag. <laughs> I'm not going to be making everybody chant wench, wench, wench. I think it's a fun word, but I'm not going to... I mean, I understand why we've gone to the efforts to reclaim the much more serious and weaponised words for promiscuity, especially for female promiscuity, like slut and hoe and hag. I'm into it. Big fat. Um, there's even a TikTok movement now to reclaim the word bimbo. Yeah, same. <laughs> No, 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 no. My first reaction was that. My first reaction was, oh, we're doing them all, are we? <laughs> I, I am busy. <laughs> oh, and then I thought, no, that's not good enough. You know, uh, of course I'm not instinctively going to care about the word bimbo because no one's ever called me a bimbo. No one's ever going to call me a bimbo. Let's face it, aesthetically, I'm as similar to Ken as I am to Barbie. <laughs> um, <laughs> But then I thought, no, it's not good enough. You can't call yourself an intersexual feminist and then not care about something because it doesn't directly apply to you. You know, educate yourself. And I'm so glad I did. The bimbos of TikTok are fascinating. So they have this whole ideology, this whole philosophy. They say that we want to have um, a hyper-feminine exterior. So, like, rack out, tits everywhere, glamorous, uh, you know, super pink, girly, cartoon-level... Like Barbie-esque level, ultra, ultra, ultra femme. But they say, despite having this that, that aesthetic, we shouldn't think to presume anything about their intelligence, their feminism, or their politics. And I was like, oh my god, I think I might be a bimbo, aren't I? <laughs> that sounds bang on the money. Of course, you shouldn't think you can look. What you're... Oh, it's amazing. But then their big like headline, their big thing that they like leave you on, is they say we bimbos think you should just be yourself and have loads of surgery. <laughs> Mm. Mm. Oh, I've missed that memo as well. I still haven't had mine yet. I've forgotten to have all the surgery. It's probably already left it too fucking late. I've learned recently that literally every single other person I work with has already had all the surgery, all the different types of work done. Everyone around me is getting all the work done. Most of my friends have transpired in the lockdown have been getting work done since before they were even 30. I'm the only one left to have not done it. I've probably missed the boat for it to be fucking effective. Anyway, no point lying about my age. I'm 39. My actual date of birth's on that Wikipedia page. It's almost insulting. <laughs> I haven't got any stalkers. But no wonder I'm having to spend a load of money on all of the poison in the cheeks. I think we've done that wrong, because I also miss the memo to start lying about my age. What's the point of getting it all done if you haven't lied about your age from whenever you were born? I never got that memo, and I think we've done it wrong. I think we've done it literally in the wrong direction. I want my Wikipedia page to say I'm 69, then he can meet me and be like, fuck me, shit's great. <laughs> That's how to save a few quid. But I sort of get it, you know, a cruel thing has happened to me in the sense it's only in the last few years I've begun enjoying looking at my own face. And don't get me wrong, I don't stop in the mirror and be like, mm, I'm going to stay here for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Hot girl summer. Um, <laughs> I, I'm busy. But I don't look at photographs of myself on my own reflection anymore and think like, <laughs> cold none of winter. Good face, actually, I think. Decent face, it's all right face, good face. What's annoying is I've only begun to genuinely believe that at exactly the same point as time has begun to melt that face. <laughs> That's not fair! It's melting it here. <laughs> it's cracking it all around there. It's droopily dangling it down there. There's all bits dangling down there. What's happening to these bits? They're going back down and then they're trying to live within me. Those bits, fuck me. I've had a look on the whole of the internet. I cannot find a single body positive influencer anywhere specifically owning her jowls. <laughs> So, of course, it's happening. Everyone around me is all doing it. Everybody's getting all the bits and bobs done, you know, and I've got people in my life who say to me, oh, I need to get work done for my career. And that makes sense, actually, if they're a poker player. <laughs> I do think there's a certain level of irony in the fact that it's comedians and actors leading the vanguard and getting our faces frozen in time when we're exactly the people who I thought as part of our work needed to be able to use our face to be able to do hundreds of thousands of different expressions and sometimes embody completely and utterly different personalities over the course of the lifetime of a career. You could argue, potentially, I need to keep every scrinkly scumbling in my face to be able to continue to do my uncanny impression of my fascist cats. <laughs> But they're all doing it. Everyone else has done it. They've all fucking done it. All your icons have done it. All the feminists have even done it. Everybody's fucking done it. There's about three comedians left. You haven't had any work done. It's me, Sarah Pascoe, and Kiri Pritchard McLean. They're doing stand-up material about it as well. They're saying, you know, no judgment. And I think for me, a bit of judgment. <laughs> <laughs> because if everyone's going to do it, I'm probably going to have to fucking do it. You know, I, if we all didn't do it, then I wouldn't have to fucking do it. I'm mainly, my judgment is of the industry. It's not of individuals. I totally understand why people would do it if everyone's going to fucking do it. The industry is. I don't know how much you know about comedy. But the irony is, they make you do it in obscurity for over a decade before they even let you on the radio! <laughs> Surely by the time you're allowed on Taskmaster, you're allowed to at Banking Knackered!
But look, I don't like some of my... The irony here, I think, is that I... Uh, especially over the course of making this show, I've learned uh, and talked to young people, I've talked to those Gen Z sisters, and they have a completely different idea on what uh, getting work done means, the potential it means for gender change and, and definition and self-identity and all of those things. They see beauty where I see something else, and it makes... My opinions make me feel older than even the jowls do. I was hanging out recently with my dad. He's got disgusting opinions on what women should be like and look like and sound like. His name's Keith. <laughs> I was hanging out recently with him and we happed upon a picture of a Kardashian who'd recently had everything done, Brazilian butt, rib out, like, everything. And I'm not proud I saw the picture and went, God, it looks like it hurts. She looks like she hates herself. And my dad went, yeah, exactly. And I was like, no! <laughs> oh, no, I sound like Keith! I don't want to sound like Keith! <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't always sound like Keith. I mean, the irony is I think it, he'd look at someone with a load of tattoos and piercings and think, oh, that looks like it hurts, they look like they hate themselves. Whereas I look at that person and think, would you like a kiss? <laughs> uh, and more recently, please, may you marry me? <laughs> but yeah, look, if everyone's doing it, I'm not promising to not do it. I'm probably going to do it if everyone's going to do it. There we go. I want to keep getting work... Uh, but there's also a, a more... Uh, a more embarrassing reason than that. I'm not, not vain enough to be the only one who fucking holds out. I'm not going to be the only comedian left who hasn't had work done in another five years' time, sat there like the lonely, furry little walnut surrounded by a load of frequency deep voice babies. <laughs> I'm just saying I resent the normality of it. I resent the fact it's become a normal part of self-care. That would be my luck, wouldn't it? I'll get my face frozen looking livid. <laughs> Or not, or I get the best work in the world done, and everyone will be like, well, yeah, well, she looks great, but if you heard, still doing Wordle. <laughs> I do like the idea that as age defying work gets more and more um, normal and, and cheap, and everyone's doing it, we'll all have to become really ingenious about how we work out anybody's real age. We'll be like, look over there. She looks about 29, but get closer. She smells of sherry. And now, <laughs> this, was where, this was where my show was pretty much meant to end, right? But um, just as I was finishing the show up, I, and I can't tell you how tricky I found it to um, turn my thoughts and feelings about Maureen into comedy, because it's really uh, tricky to write any comedy about anything you care about, let alone where you don't have a very clean, clear-cut opinion. Um, uh, and my opinions on... Oh, I keep changing, so of course my opinions keep changing. And they did on the Maureen thing, right? And just as I was finishing up this show, she, she, did, she did new stuff. She did fresh stuff. She did a double-page spread in a newspaper called The Daily Mail. Um, <laughs> suffice to say, it wasn't an apology piece. Uh, <laughs> it, it was very much doubling down on the opinions she had in the manifesto and, uh, and adding to them. There's a lot of things that she hates and there's a lot of things she'd like to do about the things that she hates. I'm not going to go into detail. I don't want to dark you out. Suffice to say, her Twitter feed reads like a QAnon curated cheese dream. Um, <laughs> if you want to know where she's at on the political spectrum generally, she makes Andrew Tate look like a lovely, sweet man. She just really cares about men's mental health. Um, <laughs> But the gist of the article, and it was supported, obviously, by the publication, was that this is freedom of speech and that's that. There can't be any consequence for it. And I'm afraid it riled me up all over again. I'm really tired of freedom of speech being wheeled out as an excuse for all and every kind of horrible actions and behaviour. There's no nuance here. There is a difference between freedom of speech and being able to disagree with each other, which, of course, I believe in. I'm a comedian. I wouldn't have a job if I didn't believe in. But there is a difference between that and running for political office. There is a difference between being able to disagree with each other and actively vying for the power to destroy people's lives because of something about themselves like their sexuality. Saying those things are exactly the same as like saying there's no difference between refusing a handshake and beating the shit out of someone. Maybe I hadn't overreacted in the first place. Saying that, she did only get 1% of the vote. <laughs> <laughs> And if you're thinking, how in an area like the one she said she lives in did Maureen even get 1% of the vote, I think we can all agree it was probably the cats. <laughs> <laughs> and if Maureen's opinions are, you know, the death throes of an ancient and nearly finished ideology, then who cares? You know, it's harmless. But if they're not, if they're the start of something or the start of a resurgence of something, then, well... Crumbs alive. <laughs>
One thing I have realised is, of course, uh, people have loaded feelings about identity at the moment. Of course, this is an identity-obsessed time. Of course, people are passionate and fired up and spicy and sensitive um, about identity. It's because they still feel threatened. They still feel unsure. They feel unsafe. And um, I I'm just going to say, I, I don't think that human beings are designed to be scared for years and years. Um, I'm just going to say, I, I think it makes them weird. <laughs> for the number of boners in the room right now. <laughs> I think we can all agree, though, that I do need to get better at taking at least a small amount of shit occasionally, you know. Um, and I have worked out a way, actually, of ending the show where you help me with that. Um, OK, um, can, can, we, can we pop some music on, please? <laughs> Just hand these turds out. Thank you. Right, has everyone who wants a turd got a turd? The game, the game is hard, way harder than it looks. Um, I, but also, let, I think we can all agree that with the music this quiet, pretty heartbreaking. Um, could we turn the music up, please, before I self-harm live? Thank you. The people of Bristol, please get a turd. Go for it, you can do this, take your time. We can all agree that couldn't have gone better. <laughs> you look stunning! You look stunning. So, yeah, my girlfriend bought this game for my son, and I think in quite brilliant news, it turned out um, he was above it. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want to play it. it. He had no interest in it, so waste not, whatnot. We waited for him to be out one afternoon. He was long gone, he was at his dad's. Um, her and I played it instead in the lounge one afternoon. Um, <laughs> We might not have had any clothes on. <laughs> really great game, actually. Really fun game. Tits everywhere. Um, but about half an hour in, um, I, I realised my curtains were completely closed. <laughs> and the only reason I spotted that is because at one point, I turned around and just locked eyes with Harmony. <laughs> You had a look on her face that said one thing, and one thing only. Oh, that's what they actually do.
Thank you very much.